I think like the next age of Bitcoin privacy is probably going to be things of like not just privacy enhancing technology, but also like making it look like normal on chain activity. You know, we figure out a way to hide amongst the crowd, but it's very obvious, you know, we're the guys in the crowd all wearing masks versus now we'll be able to be the guys in the crowd that are just like wearing everyday street clothes that look like everyone else eventually. A major problem with things like CoinJoin is, um, you know, you do a coin join and say you have like an enemy set of 100, but as time goes on, those um, other coin join participants kind of can accidentally dox it or like, you know, screw up the privacy and like merge coins or, you know, they deposit in the coin base or something. Your enemy set kind of slowly goes down over time. So you could actually just coin join a lightning channel where you could splice it without updating it. Just do a coin join of a lightning channel and that would basically allow you to like um, have even more privacy with your lightning node. If you weren't around in like 2014, um, Apple bans like all Bitcoin wallets from the App Store and you know, people are like breaking their iPhones really mad and stuff like that. That's like, well, they, so like now if you had an iPhone, you couldn't have a mobile wallet. So with, with Mutiny, you can just go to a website and now you instantly have a mobile wallet. Ben Carmen is a Lightning privacy researcher working on a handful of Lightning projects, including Mutiny Wallet, the Bitcoin company, and Vortex. In our conversation, we explored the state of Lightning Network privacy today. We discussed the challenge of improving one's privacy. And then we got into the work that Ben is doing to bring Lightning wallets directly into the browser with Mutiny Wallet. Ben has also been added to today's show splits so if you enjoy this show and if you learn something new, the best way you can support myself and Ben is by sending in sats over the Lightning Network. You can use any podcasting 2.0 app. There are lots of them, but my favorite to use is Fountain. Before we get into today's show, just a quick message from our sponsors. Today's show is sponsored by Voltage. Voltage is the premier provider of Bitcoin and Lightning node infrastructure. Today's show is also sponsored by Stackwork. And Stackwork is a lightning-powered transcription tool that takes the best of AIs and humans to create better, faster, and less expensive transcripts. We'll have more from Voltage and Stackwork later in the show. Ben, welcome to the show. I am so excited to talk about lightning privacy, mutiny, and all the work you're doing. But before we get into it, let's give listeners your background, tell everyone how you first discovered Bitcoin, and why you decided to build on lightning. Um, yeah, hey Kevin, thanks for having me. Uh, my Bitcoin journey is, uh, it feels weird. It feels like I've barely been into Bitcoin for that long, but I guess I've been here for five years, so it's kind of a while now. But um, yeah, I got into Bitcoin at the very top of 2017. Uh, like Bitcoin was at like 20K, and I was like, oh, I want to get rich too. And then um, obviously didn't. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I was like, I was in college um, studying computer science and heard about it on a comedy podcast, bought a little bit and was like, cool. And then, um, you know, price went down, but I stopped, started watching a bunch of Andreas videos and started listening to podcasts and stuff like that and quickly fell down the rabbit hole and, and my entire political beliefs changed. And uh, here we are, you know, five years later. And uh, during that, I, like maybe about a year into Bitcoin, I was like, wait, I was like, uh, I had some like shitty internship where I did nothing all day. So I just started doing like open source work in my, at my job and uh, just, you know, filling the time and I ended up like falling in love with it. And then um, later dropped out of college to like actually go and pursue that. So um, yeah, that's what I've been doing for about the last four years. And I started out working um, on Wasabi actually, and um, enjoyed that. And then later got hired full time at, uh, shared bits and did that for two years working on DLCs and um, maintaining the Bitcoin S library, which is like a Scala Im implementation of Bitcoin. And um, after that, later joined the Bitcoin company, which are, I've been here now for about a year and a half. And kind of all during that, just like my, my main like open source like interest has really just been like Bitcoin privacy. And then um, as Lightning has matured more, it's kind of has evolved into that as well, where not only is it a good privacy tool, but as well, it's, you know, it's just really cool tech anyways, too. So it's been enjoying it and all that stuff. Yeah. What attracted you to first building open source software and then second, the privacy aspects of Bitcoin and Lightning? Um, I mean, open source is just like, it's just beautiful to work on, like, 
something I love is like, you know, like the problem I have a lot of like where I work at the Bitcoin company right now is, you know, a lot of our stuff is just like, we're talking to like gift card, you know, random APIs and stuff. And it's like, if something breaks, it's like, I can't just like, oh, let me just go to the GitHub and see like, what am I doing wrong or something? It's like, oh, I got a file support ticket or send an email to some like, you know, random dude that is like a terrible worker and uh, get a, you know, get a reply back in like a week versus open source be like, oh, let me just go read the code and see what is happening here. Maybe it's a bug on their end. Maybe it's a bug on my end. Maybe the documentation is bad and I can fix that. Like you kind of own the whole stack um, almost always. So it's really nice to like, you just have complete control of what you're doing. And it's like, you end up collaborating with like some of the coolest people in the world where like, you know, like you make a pull request to Bitcoin core and Peter Wall reviews your PR. It's like, holy shit. Like you don't get that level of uh, like expertise, like in a normal job. So like, you know, you learn, like, I remember like my first pull request to Bitcoin core was a documentation PR. And I, I learned like so much in just that PR. It was like really cool. And, um, you know, it's, it's kind of like a beautiful thing. It's like all the collaboration that happens between open source, not just like inside of a project, but you know, between projects and stuff like that. So that's what I really enjoyed. And then privacy is a cool thing. Cause you know, it's kind of like, not just something that's like, you know, obviously it's good for the world and benefits people. But it's also a very hard problem. So like, it's something that you can, it's not just like, oh, let me just add privacy real quick. It's something you like, you know, you need to think about and it's always evolving and, you know, it's, you know, it's a, it's an arms race of where, you know, you're, you get better than the, the attackers get better. And so you're always like trying to improve and it's, it's really like a hard thing. And like, but once you accomplish it, it's pretty cool. You were just like, I sent a transaction that no one knows about. And, um, you know, it's a powerful feeling to have and really actually, you know, it's not like, you know, you can build something like, uh, I don't know, just like a random Bitcoin app, but if it's you know if it's private you could actually like you know change the difference for the world versus like just along the, like you know, along the send payments is what every bitcoin wallet does but making a private payment is not something that everyone can provide and that is actually like a lot more powerful right you just said privacy is an arms race who's winning the arms race right now in bitcoin that's a good question um i don't know i think I think we probably are because, um, you know, there's like chain analysis and, you know, and like elliptic and all their competitors and stuff. And, you know, actually they make a lot of money, which is one scary, but the thing is, you know, the, the privacy devs are <laughs> heavily underfunded and, um, we seem to be like, you know, winning in that regard where, um, if we, you know, these chain analysis people, they, they, they can't do anything against like things like coin join or lightning. So when, you know, like th that's why, like, you know, when, when, uh, places like BlockFi were like blocking withdrawal or uh, deposits of coin joint funds, it's because, you know, we won in that regard where they, they're like, we can't track this. So what do we do? So they just had the resort to blocking it. So I think that, I think that's a sign of us winning where, you know, we, we've reached a point where they're just like, we, we, we know this is anonymous. We, we don't know where it's coming from and they have to, uh, you know, just throw their hands up and be like, sorry. I mean, it is bad that they block it, but you know, that's what happens when you work with regulated institutions. So I think in that regard, we're winning, but, um, you know, it's, there's always ways to improve. Um, and you know, a lot of it too, isn't just like, you know, adding things to Bitcoin or writing like better software. A lot of it's as well as just like education and like telling users, like, you know, don't, you know, don't do this, don't do that. Because, you know, sometimes like, you know, when you first get into Bitcoin, you might just use one address and you're like, oh, this is easy. But it's like, you know, you quickly realize like, oh, you know, you shouldn't reuse addresses if you care about privacy. And, you know, that's a lot of things is like, you know, super simple things like that, where, you know, you can have the best users in the world being the most private, but, you know, if, if everyone on Bitcoin is reusing addresses, then it doesn't totally matter because you want a huge anonymity set of all Bitcoin users. So to do that, you need everyone improving their privacy. Hmm. It strikes me that are there two parts to this privacy battle? Like the the one side you mentioned where you have a coin join or some kind of um, privacy practice that's put in place to make transactions anonymous or hard to track. Uh, and at, at some point, a service might throw their hands up in the air and say, hey, we can't do anything about this. We're going to stop all transactions. Right. But that presents another problem, which is like, you could win the privacy battle and and 
come up with a solution that can't be tracked. But if you then lose the regulatory battle and have all the services out there not allow you know people who use this coin join or whatever whatever privacy preserving tactic it is, if all these other services get regulated to the point where they can't even service those people, it almost it, it almost ends up being a bit of a loss, right? Like there's there's it's all, it feels like there's almost two battles that you have to win. Is that yes. true? Yeah, definitely. Like the thing is like, um, the reason they're able to block this like transaction, they say like, it's explicitly like a coin join. It's very obvious on chain when someone's doing a coin join. So like this user is seeking privacy. We don't like that. So then they, uh, they, they block it. So I think like the next age of Bitcoin privacy is probably going to be things of like, not just privacy enhancing technology, but also like making it look like normal on chain activity or just any Bitcoin activity. So like lightning is a perfect, um, thing of this because like lightning is a straight like ux improvement of bitcoin i think it improves a lot of things you know faster payments cheaper payments you know we, we you know you you run a lightning podcast but um you know but as well it increases like sender privacy a whole bunch where if i deposit into exchange the exchange has no idea where that money came from so like you know when chain analysis is like where this money come from they're like oh we don't know that's how sorry that's how lightning works and um, so, like, you know, if they want to support Lightning, then it's just like, well, sorry, we're giving users privacy. So I think things like that improve it. And um, and for on-chain, there's, like, lots of different ideas on how to do this. There's stuff like CoinSwap, where instead of doing, like, was it CoinJoin, do you, like, swap coins with users? And you can, like, trade histories. Um, also, um, Waxwing, he gave a really good talk at Bitcoin++. Plus Plus. I don't know if it's up on YouTube yet, but it will be eventually. And um, he talked about this thing, CoinJoin XT. Basically, you do coin joins that don't don't that don't look like coin joins. You, it looks exactly like normal on chain activity, and um, by doing that, then it's just like oh, it looks like this user made ten payments, but actually, you know, they this isn't that user anymore. They did a bunch of coin joins, and uh, this is now you know, I mean, you have soft coins, and now um, you know they don't know exactly where the money came from when you deposited it. So. Stuff like that should improve it a lot where like right now, most of our privacy techniques are explicit. You're saying like, I am a privacy seeking user and you know, the powers up, you don't like that. So they try to stop that. But as we move further into this stuff, like we've solved like the, okay, we can kind of, you know, we figure out a way to hide amongst the crowd, but it's very obvious, you know, we're the guys in the crowd all wearing masks versus now we'll be able to be the guys in the crowd that are just like wearing everyday street clothes that look like everyone else eventually. And that will really help the, the, the privacy aspects moving forward. We're now like, like you're kind of talking about the sensors of persistent access of privacy where today they can censor us using it. But after this stuff, we could, you know, blend into the crowd completely and they wouldn't even know that we are privacy seeking individuals. Right. That makes sense. In, in preparation for this conversation, I took a look through the cypherpunk manifesto from Eric Hughes, and I want to just read off a section of it that I thought was particularly relevant. Uh, Eric says, when my identity is revealed by the underlying mechanism of a transaction, I have no privacy. I cannot here selectively reveal myself. I must always reveal myself. Therefore, privacy in an open society requires anonymous transaction systems. He says, until now, cash has been the primary such system. An anonymous transaction system is not a secret transaction system. An anonymous system empowers individuals to reveal their identity when desired and only when desired. This is the essence of privacy. So my question to you is, is the Lightning Network going to be the privacy preserving successor to cash? Maybe I don't totally know the, the 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 lightning lightning has a problem or I don't know a problem but a trade off of as the more you increase privacy the lower payment reliability becomes so um, today we have like I don't know decent payment reliability where you know like um, before this we were trying to use Vita Live I was able to deposit ten dollars easily and it worked just fine um, so you know it works but you know if if maybe if like if Vito was using the most private way of using Lightning and I was too, maybe the payment wouldn't um, work as well. And you know that has trade offs where now you know if everything was over Tor, then payments going to go a lot slower, and you know connections could drop accidentally and stuff. Um, you know and if you're also using stuff like binded routes, 
then you know you can't try every route that I, I can find in the graph and stuff like that. So it does get harder. So um, you know, it's it's kind of like I think that eventually the Lightning community is gonna have to kind of make a decision of like, or maybe it'll just bifurcate of like which way are we moving? Are we gonna go towards like maybe we just say like fuck it, live lightning's not gonna be the private payment network. We um we were gonna focus on hundred percent of payment reliability and then we build privacy as a layer three on top of it. Or maybe we say Lightning should be our private payment network. And, um, you know, we focus 100% on privacy and then, you know, payment reliability goes down. And um, then we just like work on ways to solve that later. Um, you know, it's it's all trade-offs, but um, I think we can reach a good middle ground. And as well, as I said, like the, the network can bifurcate where you could have, you know, payments from River to Zebedee be 100% reliable. But, you know, if you know, if you have like, you know, activists in North Korea paying to, um, I don't know, activists in Africa, maybe that'll be a harder payment, but you know, if it's more private, then, you know, it's kind of worth it for them. So I think it eventually probably just be trade-offs, but I, it does like have much better properties than Bitcoin in some regards of privacy. So I, I think we can achieve it. It's just, um, a lot of work to go. Right. Are privacy and reliability always going to be trade-offs? Like what, what's the fundamental reason why these two, you're trading off one for the other? Um, the main reason is like in on Lightning, you have like these, I guess like to start out, I guess on Bitcoin, you know, you just have to say, I want to send my funds to this address and that's it. You don't need to like have like these hops or anything. So the, the main privacy concern there is just like, where did my funds come from? And now I'm going to link it to your address. So um, you're worrying more about like previous history versus with Lightning, you kind of have this fixed node ID that um, you tie like all of your channels to and um, you know all of your receives are saying like, this is my node ID, please pay me. So um, you kind of, you're kind of inherently reusing the address always in Lightning when you receive uh, money. That's like the the main problem in privacy, and as well for the reliability, we don't just say I'm saying to this address. We have to have find a payment route across the network to this thing. So if you make my you know my node ID harder to find, well now it's harder to actually find a payment to to reach you. So that's like the main trade off you get there. Where like like one of the most likely things that will be happening in Lightning in the next few years is something called blinded pass, which basically says um, you don't really give your node ID. You say like, here's an encrypted way to get to my node ID. And then as it, it uses like the onion routing to find you. But the thing is you supply that. So you say like, this is a blinded path to get to me. And the thing is, if that path doesn't work, then the user can't make an, another attempt to pay you because that's the only way they know how to get to you is that blinded path they get to you versus like if today, if you don't use a blinded path, then it just, you know, if that one fails, they just try not, they can try like, you know, a hundred different paths until it works. So, you know, it would become then like, oh, that path didn't work. And then you try to, you know, you give them a, def a different one and they try again, maybe that doesn't work and, you know, things can fail. So it's a lot harder in that regard. And as well with things like, you know, just using like clear net over Tor like, you know, Tor is much slower. So they just, you know, payments take longer and stuff like that. So it's just, you know, all different trade-offs there that are hard to do. But um, I think mm -hmm. we're going to move in the right direction. But I mean, yeah. Yeah. Now, I think you might be biased about for this next question. But I have to ask whether or not you think, you mentioned this bifurcation possibility that the Lightning community could split or could decide we're going to go all in on reliability or all in on privacy. If if that were to be true, which direction do you think the Lightning community should push push in towards privacy or towards reliability? This is an interesting pro, uh, question. Like, honestly, it, it should probably be both, and it's just like users will pick which one they want. Like, maybe like you know when it's you know. River paying Zebedee, they're just like, you know, it's a company to a company, so they don't care. So they, they'll do the completely like reliable way, totally, you know, unprivate payment or, you know, not unprivate, but less private than it could be. And then, you know, when I'm say like, you know, rece receiving donations or, you know, or, um, you know, someone on the internet that's 
you know, like Hollow Knight is raising funds for his um, uh, tr court trial or something like that. You know, he wants to accept it more privately, so then they would use more privacy seeking uh, lightning techniques. I think that's a perfectly viable world where, um, you know, it, instead of like it being a network wide decision, it's a user side decision. Um, the only problem there is things like routing nodes. If you try to run like a completely private routing node, you kind of get screwed or you just kind of screw like over other people where like if you're using like Tor and stuff, now like my payment tries to go through you and it ends up being like, you know, way slower. So there's kind of trade-offs there, but, mo but most, in most regards, it should be like a kind of user decision. So that should um, kind of make it better. But, you know, it is, you know, you know, if I, if I don't support, if like my wallet doesn't support those privacy features that pay you, then I just can't pay you. But, you know, I think that should be easily solvable because most people are good at updating and stuff. But yeah, mm -hmm. I think, I don't think we'd have a total like bifurcation. It'd just be like, kind of like, okay, I'm going to download uh, Moon Wallet. Okay, this is the reliable wallet. It's not private. And then, okay, I'm going to download, I don't know, yeah, you know, private lighting wallet. Okay, this one's more private and can make payments um, in the ways I want. So I think it would more move to that regard, but um, I mean, we'll see. Yeah. Do you think people today using the Lightning Network understand the importance of privacy? Do you think there's a gap in educating people about it or... I'd just love to hear your sentiment on on how aware people are today about their privacy. And, you know, I think I think you view this as a very important issue. And I think there's some Bitcoiners that do as well, but I get the feeling that it's not everyone. And certainly when I step outside of the Bitcoin space, I, I never hear talk about privacy. Like everyone knows all their data is online everywhere and they basically have given it up. Yeah. So I, mean... I, I wonder, do you think... Bitcoiners as a group have are, are appreciating the importance of privacy. Yeah, it's it's a hard problem. I know like, Bitcoiners are definitely doing better than normies. Like, I mean, right now I'm in my childhood bedroom, and uh, you know, my parents have an Alexa downstairs. Like, it's just like you know, they're totally owned. But um, I think like Bitcoiners are definitely more conscious of it, and at least like they won't make fun of you for seeking privacy. They're like, oh, okay, like uh, I. I, I I congratulate you, but some people are like, I'm too lazy or I have better things to do, or I don't want to, you know, they don't want to pay the trade-offs, which is fine. You know, it's like uh, the, the quote you just read, like you're allowed, like you're allowed to reveal information if you'd like to. So um, you should just be conscious of that and know the implications, I think. So if you're, you know, if you're willing to, you know, if you want payment reliability and not uh, privacy, that's fine. You know, there's nothing against that, you know, making a quick payment for coffee is act is extremely nice. So, um, you know, that's fine. But yeah, I think the, I think the lightning community by and large does understand it. I, I think like, I think a, a good data point on that is, um, like recently when Amboss announced they were gonna, um, like have people extend all their channel balances to them. Everyone was like, what the fuck are you doing? This is not cool. And they kind of rescinded that. So it seems, like people kind of care, um, you know, it's not, you know, it's not as good as it could be. Um, a lot of people still do a lot of bad privacy practices and stuff, but um, I think by and large, there is a, uh, at least people know that they should care about it and um, want want to care about it. So I think, and then when there are just obvious things like that, they like, they're like, well, we cannot do this. This is not good for people. So it does seem like people are actually um, working on it and stuff. Mm-hmm. So far, it feels like the fight for privacy, at least in the Bitcoin and Lightning community, has been a bottom-up fight where it's been advocates and users demanding privacy themselves and not a top-down one where a company or a government is improving the privacy for their users or their citizens. Um, but recently, I have seen a couple of promising announcements from Apple and Google trending in the direction of more privacy. I believe both released end-to-end -end encryption. I think I think Google did Gmail and Apple did some iCloud upgrades. I wonder, is this is is there a case for top-down privacy? Or is that does that go against the idea of of users kind of enforcing their own privacy? I, I think there is a an extremely strong case for it. Like um I think like a, a 
the good statistic on this and definitely why you should um like once apple rolls out the encrypted uh backups you should definitely use it is like i think apple complies with 90 percent of all like um when they like the government request data from them they they were they were give it back 90 percent of the time so like i mean not only is that just like a waste of their time and a huge headache but it's like a who's like they probably have an entire lawyer staff they need to pay of like approving and denying these and just like all this you know, actual software they're right to, right, to like extract that data and give it to the government and stuff like that. If you can just say like, the other hands up, be like, sorry, we don't have the data. We can't give it to you. It's encrypted. Th- then it's just like, they don't have that problem anymore of like having to deal with that. And um, I, I think we also, we saw that pretty well during the um, the truckers stuff in Canada when um, they're like, the, the government was like susp- subpoenaing like non-custodial wallets. They're like, dude, we don't have the money. It's a non-custodial wallet. And it's like, you know, when you don't have that, when you don't have the power to like screw over your users, it just makes it life easier. You start like, sorry, I can't. And then, you know, there's nothing they can do. So I think it, it definitely like lowers your burden on required need of like things you need to worry about, like regulatory wise. Um, you know, it does make the actual software, you know, sometimes less user friendly or um, harder to use or harder to develop. But um I think like, you know, we have good enough engineers in the world to solve that problem. I think the getting around the, the lawyer stuff is like always a nightmare, no matter who you are. So I think that's a huge bus for, uh, you know, the top down case. And, uh, I think, you know, I, I think I did like the two cases you just mentioned, I think are hopefully proof of that. If, even if it's just users demanding it, or if they're just like, this is a headache to deal with, I think it's all an improvement either way. Mm-hmm. So, okay, that makes sense. There's a case then for companies to get rid of their legal overhead and their expense headaches by implementing privacy practices that don't even let them see the data that a government might want to access. But now at the very extreme end of this top-down approach, is there a case for a government ever trying to promote privacy? I mean, that's typically the person that you're you know, shielding information from, or you're saying, I, I don't want to reveal this information to a government. Is there any case for, could you make a case for a government wanting their citizens to have more privacy? Because we can do it at the company level. I, I think you probably can make a case. Um, I mean, yeah, like you said, like what, normally you're fighting against your own government. Um, you know, if we did live in a world where our government actually cared about us, I think like, we could have that where I, like a good example is like um, when the Equifax happened here in America, like I think like, you know, tons of like a hundred million people's like entire tax info got leaked. And, you know, I think the, and the data was then, you know, probably quickly sold to like, you know, all of China and like our enemies and stuff like that. So, you know, if our government actually cared about like privacy and security, then, you know, all of our citizens data would not have been given to our, you know, an adversary. So, I think that's like a strong case for them, you know, but the problem is they care much more about being able to use that data against us than China using it against them. So it probably won't happen, but I think like, you know, there is a case for them to like, you know, if we're like national security of like, we don't want our enemies having data on our citizens and as well, like, you know, the, like, you know, they're like CIA agents or like NSA agents or, you know, military personnel are included in that data so they can use it against like important people and stuff like that. So maybe that's the case, but I mean, I would, I wouldn't bet on it. (laughs) Yeah, that's fair. Um, Okay. That's, that's really good stuff. I want to shift the conversation to a report that you worked on recently, a lightning privacy report. And you did this this great report. I'll link it in the description. It highlighted three different sections of Lightning privacy. One was a routing analysis. One was channel coin joins. One was blinded paths and trampoline routing. Um, could I get you to kind of explain at a high level how each of those three items might harm a Lightning user's privacy? Yeah, um, this was some work that me, Evan Kaloudis, Tony Giorgio, and Paul Miller, um, I guess, and Max Hillebrand got sponsored to do by um, Wasabi and Magic Grants to uh, work work on just like basically just like kind of doing an overview of Lightning privacy and like how would you design a privacy focused wallet. And um, this is kind of like just the report we came up with after some research and like talking to various members in Lightning community as well as just doing our own research. 
And um, yeah, so if you go to lightningprivacy.com, you can read all the like I guess, articles or blog posts about it. But um, yeah, so I guess I just go through each um, individually. It's like routing analysis is kind of, you know, when I'm making a payment, no, not to a direct channel party, but like across the network, how do I make sure that um, someone doesn't know information about this payment? So like Lightning has this nice property of um, what's called onion routing, where if I'm, you know, if Alice is paying Bob, or, you know, so let's say Alice is paying Carol, but, has, um, but they both have a channel to Bob. Bob just knows, okay, Alice sent a payment to me. And I need to forward it to Carol. He doesn't know, um, you know, if Carol's the actual recipient or if it's then going to Dave. Um, Bob doesn't know if Alice was the actual sender, if it previously came from someone before. Um, and if you incorporate things like multi-path payments, he doesn't even know the amount and stuff like that. Um, but... There are some like different ways you can actually still find out a lot of information. Um, there's been some good research papers on stuff like, you know, if you are able to probe um, lots of channels, um, but basically like a probe is just like, you kind of send fake payments to a node and see if they succeed or not based on, or, you know, 60, they, they all fail, but you get different error messages on um, why it failed. And um, you can kind of get lean information for that, where if you get like an error message from like, um, if you're say trying to probe Alice, but you get an error message from Bob, you, you know, okay, this payment was probably too small and you can lower the payment size and then it makes it to, to Alice. Now, you know, okay, this channel has about this much balance and you can just try different amounts to kind of, we you know, and to see like, okay, their channel has, you know, 0.1 Bitcoin in it. And, uh, you can kind of glean that from just probing for free. So, um, kind of the idea of like all of this is like, how do we solve these kind of problems? Like when making payments? And like kind of what we found is like the the biggest like kind of one of the biggest problem right now that was planned to be fixed is um, basically using hash time lock contracts instead of point time lock contracts. So like basically like right now your lightning payment is secured by a hash where when you make a payment, everyone along the entire route says like this is the hash and then they unlock it with a pre-image. And if you don't know what those terms means, it doesn't really matter. That's kind of the, the idea. And um, the problem is that hash is, is, is exactly the same along the entire route. So if like, you know, if Alice, Bob and Carol all collude and it's like, hey, look, we had the same payment and um, they can glean some information about that. Especially if, if like, say if Alice, Bob and Carol are all the same actor, well then you thought you made, you know, a payment across three peers and you got some privacy, but actually it was the same person. And now they have, um, you know, now they have the extra information. So something called point time lock contracts will let this fix this. Um, basically works the exact same as HTLCs or hash time lock contracts. But with, um, with these, we can make it so that instead of having the payment hash being the same across the entire route, it'll be a random number between each peer. So you wouldn't have it like a direct be like, okay, we have the exact same payment kind of thing. So that would improve um, kind of payment privacy a lot where now you can't just like, run a bunch of routing nodes across the network and, and see like payments going across um, all the way. Um, that is planned to actually come to the Lightning Network. It's been like planned like way before we wrote any privacy research stuff. And it's actually, I, I mean, it's, it's a huge privacy improvement, but it does fix some like minor attacks as well. Um, so that's like one of the main ones we found. But the thing is too, even if we use this um, point in time life contracts and you can see now longer to have this like def definitive, like, oh, this is the same payment, but you can still kind of do some analysis where, you know, if in the same second we both receive, if I like send a payment off and then it comes to my other node with like, you know, the pretty much the same amount, well, then it's kind of, it might be like, okay, I just got a million sat payment and then a million sat payment showed up on another node. Those are probably the same payment. So things like, um, it's basically, we call it like timing analysis and amount analysis or other problems. Um, these are kind of, uh, the timing analysis is really hard to solve. Like this comes again to the payment reliability versus privacy stuff where you could say like, okay, here's a payment, but don't forward it for three seconds. Um, so that would, you know, kind of hurt the timing analysis. The problem is now my payment's gonna take three, at least three seconds longer. So, you know, you're hurting your payment reliability. So there's another trade off there. And, and with the amount analysis, we can, kind of solve that with things like um, multi-path payments where instead of just making a straight shot payment to someone, you split it up. 
Um, so there are kind of solutions there, but uh, we kind of go into more details on how like maybe a perfect version of um, doing multi-path payments could do um, could work because today I think most implementations just did like um, they just implemented it in like kind of a naive way of just like let's just split it up and just like keep having the amount until it works instead of uh, you know kind of trying to seek like more privacy seeking ways of doing those payment of the splitting and stuff so um, you know that's kind of some uh, recommendations we gave on stuff like that. So, um, yeah, we get, we have some cool graphics in, in there as well. If you want to look at that stuff, I hope you're enjoying the show so far. Just a quick message from our sponsor voltage voltage empowers engineers to integrate Bitcoin and lightning network payments into their business stack with an enterprise grade experience. The team at voltage is building the complete tool set so that you can do more than simply spin up nodes, but also understand and interpret your nodes data. Their new product, Surge, gives engineers the capability to quickly solve problems and optimize operations. With node insights and visibility through time series data, you get dynamic and complex insights never available before. You can get complete control with insanely fast onboarding, advanced client-side encryption, and zero management infrastructure, making backups, networking, and upgrades simple. Get a free seven-day trial today at Voltage.Cloud. And so that's the routing analysis, uh, the the first section there. What about channel coin joins? How how can that help improve someone's privacy? Yeah, so this is what the section I wrote primarily. Um, so yeah, basically, this is it's a Lightning privacy problem, but it's mostly actually like an on-chain privacy problem where um, you know Lightning's great, has all these nice privacy properties. You know, we don't save payments forever. Or, you know, and we have this nice onion routing, all the stuff I just talked about. But, you know, at the end of the day, you have to open a channel with your on-chain Bitcoin. And um, if you, you know, if you opened it with like your KYC funds from Coinbase, now it's kind of obvious, okay, Coinbase is like this guy just opened a lightning channel. You know, Ben Carmen owns that node. That's not the best. So using things like, um, just, you know, using just traditional on-chain privacy techniques can really improve your lightning privacy because um, now, now instead of, linking all of your, you know, funds that are linked to your identity to now, an, uh, you know, a random pub key, you could like actually uh, break that link with like something like CoinJoin. Um, so I kind of break down like multiple different ways of how to do this. The first is like kind of what you can do today where you just, um, you know, like take your, your normal Bitcoin and like CoinJoin it in something like, you know, Samurai Wasabi or Join Market and then and then you just like send that to LND, open a channel, and now you have a more private lighting channel, which is interesting and cool and huge improvement. But what um, I think is more exciting is uh, like basically opening opening lighting channels inside of a coin join. Um, so basically, if you could instead of like you know doing this like three step process of like getting Bitcoin, coin joining it, and then sending it to a um, your, your lightning wallet and then opening a channel, you know, it's a lot of steps there. Instead, if you just had your lightning wallet coin join the funds inside and then open a channel in, inside of that coin join, you would greatly improve your privacy because I mean, one, you're just saving on chain space and uh, time and fees. So that's really nice. But as well, you're, you kind of like, not only are you improving your privacy, but if everyone else is opening lightning channels, you're improving privacy for the entire network. And privacy only comes from, you know, hiding amongst a crowd. So if it's just you doing it, then, you know, it's like, oh, ben, I know Ben, he's the guy that does that. Um, that's him. But, you know, if you and a thousand other people are doing it, now it's a lot harder to delineate who's doing what. And um, the really cool thing is, like, once you're opening channels inside of a coin join, now they don't know, okay, like, your your channel counterpart, you'd be like, okay, I know um, this channel came from this person, but they have no idea, like, the fund linkage is very hard to do. And as well, um, in that transaction, there's like a bunch of other channel opens. And now they don't know, okay, are those Ben's channel opens or are those Kevin's channel opens? Who's like, they don't know if, so you're kind of getting this more privacy of like, you know, cause not, you normally don't just open one channel, you open many channels. So this would kind of improve that where you can just kind of open many channels without revealing that, okay, I just opened five channels, I just opened one. It just looks like, you persist in a coin join opening channel. So only your channel counterparties would know exactly where this is coming from. So that would improve it a lot. And then, um, but the, the problem is today that the current coin join implementations um, 
wouldn't really support this because opening lightning channels is actually kind of a hard problem. There's like, um, there's a lot of like denial of service st um, stuff built into lightning implementations to make it so you can't just like say you're going to open a thousand channels to someone and then never do. And then they have to like forced to do all this processing and stuff. So um, there's like all these like timeouts and timing stuff to prevent like, you know, a DDoS attacker on your lightning node. So um, it, it, it kind of makes it so your lightning or your coin join um, implementation needs to be aware of all these to have to be able to properly do a coin join. Um, so mm -hmm. I kind of talk about that in there. And then um, further, we kind of talk about like, what would be the end game of like the coolest version of this? And um, something that we came across um, that would be probably, which I think is like, would be really awesome is splicing coin joins. So um, if you don't know what splicing is, it's basically like a way to update a lighting channel. So you can like have an open lighting channel and be like, you know, say you have a, me and you have a one Bitcoin channel, but we're getting a ton of payments, right? Like, let's make this a two Bitcoin channel. What we normally have to do is either just open another one Bitcoin channel or close it and then open a two Bitcoin channel. But that's, you know, extra on-chain transactions and we're gonna have some downtime or, you know, if the two channel ways, it's kind of ugly. So um, what you can do is um, with splicing, you basically just kind of update the channel where we do a transaction to basically like we'll, we'll add in that one more Bitcoin and um, the, the channel will never close. It'll just be confirming and we can still make payments during that um, confirming stage. And with that, you can um, kind of like update a channel. And uh, the cool thing is this coin join or this uh, splice protocol allows for not just like two channel parties to participate, it allows for anyone on the network per to participate. So like, I'll say like, hey, let's splice. And then you're like, cool. And then once we agree to splice, we'll announce to our peers like, hey, we're doing a splice if you wanna get, get in on this. And they can come and join and then they'll do the same talk to their peers. So you kind of end up getting like this huge transaction of many um, splices. And um, around this, you could build basically a coin join. You can say like, you know, me and all my um, peers are just doing a big um, splice to like update our channels. And um, the cool thing is if we ended up doing something where like we could just not um, add or um, remove funds from this splice, we could just say, well, we have all these open lighting channels. They've been open for a year. I want to make it and update it. So it's more, I, I want to like remix my coins again, basically in um, coin join. So you could actually just coin join a lightning channel where you could splice it without updating it and just do a coin join of a lightning channel. And that would basically allow you to like um, have even more privacy with your lightning node where there's a, a, a major, a major problem with things like coin join is, um, you know, you do a coin join and say you have like an enemy set of a hundred, but as time goes on, those um, other coin join participants kind of can accidentally dox it or like, you know, screw up the privacy and like merge coins or, you know, they deposit in the coin base or something. Your enemy set kind of slowly goes down over time. So with this, you know, it, with the lighting channel, it's kind of supposed to be like stuck open forever, but with this, you could kind of remix it and kind of get that privacy back of um, always being able to coin join. And as well, like this could greatly improve uh, just coin join and lightning liquidity work. You know, I think like today, like Samurai, maybe it probably has like one of the most highest volume. They're like, have like 5,000 Bitcoin in uh, their like pool of uh, coin join funds. But I think Lightning is like in the same regards. Like, you know, if we can merge those two, that's now we're doubling both um, size of like coins on liquidity and Lightning liquidity. So I think that could be a huge boon for both. And um, we write about it more in there and how it could work and all the trade offs. But I think that would be one of the coolest potential things we could do. But the problem is splicing is years away. But um, uh, mm. I'm excited about that though. That is very interesting. And just on the topic of coin joins, uh, I think you mentioned Samurai has 5,000 Bitcoin in their coin join implementation. It, do we have any idea of how big this crowd of users is or any estimate on it? Because you know that you mentioned hiding within a crowd is kind of the idea for, for privacy with coin joins. How, how big is this pool in terms of number of people today? Or can we, can we estimate that? I don't know if we can estimate it. I mean, um, it's hard because if you just made the assumption like one UTXO, one user, it would be like a huge number and probably not a very good number. Um, so it's kind of hard. Um, 
I don't, I, the nice thing is like Samurai only, doesn't even know that number. So mm. it's kind of hard to estimate, but um, I don't know. I, I, the nice thing is that like with a lot of times like with Bitcoin privacy, you're, like the user count is important as well, but the liquidity account is just as important because like if you come in with a hundred Bitcoin and everyone else has one Bitcoin, that's like, okay, that's that one dude with a lot of money and he's doing it. So not only do you want high user count, but you want high liquidity. So like big amounts can come in and small amounts can come in and look the same. So, um, it, you know, it, we may not have the exact user account, but if we have enough liquidity, it should be okay. Kind of so thing. this 5,000 Bitcoin, what exactly does it represent then? What, what is liquidity in terms of, in the context of a coin join? Um, so like this 5,000 Bitcoin kind of represents like 5,000 Bitcoin has gone through Samurai and has not been, um, like spent out of it basically. So like there's like 5,000 Bitcoin that's been coin joined and they're just sitting there now. They could be going to remix later or not, but it's been like, um, it's been coin joined through their coordinator. So you can kind of, it kind of looks like that this 5,000 Bitcoin is all, um, you know, in the same UTXO cluster kind of thing where, you know, chain analysis sees like one of these um, UTXOs is, is no, okay, this is a Samurai user. Is it Ben? Is it Kevin? Is it Joe? I don't fucking know. It's a Samurai user and that's all they know. Hmm. I see. Um, okay. Let, let's go then to the third topic of this lightning privacy paper, uh, blinded paths and trampoline routing. Tell me more about those. Yeah. So this was, um, around basically like kind of receiver side privacy. So like the, the first, um, topic we talked about the routing analysis stuff is kind of like on sender side privacy where. Senders actually have pretty good privacy. They, um, you know, when you receive a payment, you don't know where it came from. You just know this was the last hop they gave it to me and stuff like that. So that's pretty nice. But the, the receiver side has actually kind of terrible privacy on Lightning. Um, for one, like you have this fixed node ID. So it's basically like you're always re reusing address on Bitcoin where everyone just knows, okay, like, you know, you just look it up on Amboss and you can see like, okay, this is this user's node. Here's all their public channels. Oh, look, they have about like one Bitcoin of channels and you like, go oh, and you know, you can delete a lot of information from that. And, um, you know, you can see like their fees and stuff like that and make estimates on how much they're earning. So there's a lot of problems there. So, um, if you like, if I wanted to receive a payment, I have to kind of, I get, I have to give you my note ID and say like, this is me. And you, then you can just go and look it up and see what you're doing. And, um, that's kind of a problem. You know, like if I'm making a payment or if you're like, yeah, if I'm making a payment to you, maybe you trust me, you know, like, yeah, Ben's not gonna, you know, I don't care if Ben sees that information, but the problem is like, you know, if I'm making a payment or if, or if I'm like making a withdrawal from strike, well, maybe I don't trust strike and, you know, I don't want, uh, you know, prime trust or, you know, us government to like, know that this is my node and you know, I have all this money on it. You know, maybe I bought a bunch of KYC free Bitcoin, but then received a one dollar payment from Strike, and now they see like, oh, Ben Carmen has a, all this KYC free Bitcoin. So that would be a problem. So the kind of solution to this is basically just figuring out ways to hide that node ID. And uh, the first is a uh, blinded pass, where basically we kind of talked about it earlier, but basically you're saying instead of just saying like, this is my node ID, I say this is encrypted path to pay me. Um, and then, so basically just, you just start from the path and figure out how to, um, you just give it to like one guy and then he can unlock the next, um, hop and then they'll each unlock the next hop until they figure out how to eventually get to you. Um, this does, um, reduce payment reliability. Like we've talked about where, you know, if that blinded path I give you doesn't work, then that's the only way you know how to get to me. But, um, it does improve privacy a lot. And, um, is probably like the best solution we have for um, a receiver privacy. And it's like, I, I know um, if you've been watching Lightning Privacy for a while, you probably have heard of um, rendezvous routing. This is basically just like the rendezvous routing version 2.0 of like basically the best way to do that. Um, this is actually hopefully being rolled out soon. I know um, Eclair has mostly support for it now and um, I think someone else is working support on it. And I know Eclair definitely has support for the next thing, trampoline routing, um, which is basically a way to kind of just say, it's when you're making a payment, you say, um, I guess it can be for both for, yeah, it's on, it's on both sides. So 
But basically, like if I want to receive a payment, let's say I'm, I'm not a well connected node or anything like that, you could say use this trampoline to get to me. They know how to get to me. So then the sender will then just send it to that trampoline, and then the trampoline will get it to get it to the end user. And um, so this lets you kind of like delineate your routing to that trampoline. And um, you can actually chain these trampolines. So you could say like, okay, get to this trampoline and then this one, then this one, then pay me. So you kind of get a lot of these hops of privacy and the, the trampoline doesn't know if that next, like where they're sending it, if, if it's a trampoline or if it's the actual end user. So you kind of can create like this, like multi-layered routing kind of thing of uh, your payments. And this is kind of like the way to fix um, blinded path, like payment reliability, where now if like, I know this trampoline can always pay me, and then um, then they can get to their, there and do this. Um, uh, then they do like the blinded path magic to like get to me and it's a little more um, private. So like mm -hmm. merging these two makes it kind of like, hopefully the best solution we have. And nice thing is too, um, trampoline routing is actually like a, good UX improvement for things like mobile wallets. Cause like right now, like mobile wallets, they either need to sync the entire chain graph um, of like, or a network graph of like all lightning nodes so they can like make payments and figure out how to like make a routed payment to, to someone. But um, you know, so it's a lot of data as well as can be fairly like CPU intensive. And um, you know, you need to always keep it up to date with all the channels opening and closing. But, you know, a lot of times, you know, my phone, you know, maybe if I only make a lightning payment once a month, then I have to like sync that all again and do all the recalculations and downloads. So that's a lot. So I can just offload that to like my LSP and be like, you go make this payment. Um, but a lot of times that's not very private. You just say like, hey, I'm paying this guy. Can you pay for me? So, you know, you kind of lose your, your um, sender privacy. So with trampoline, you could say, hey, I'm making a payment, but just send it to this other trampoline. And then so that... So now you're kind of like offloading that where they don't know, okay, like say, like if you say, um, say you're using like Phoenix and so you're connected to the async node, they're your trampoline. But now I say like bit refill is also a trampoline. Then it could look like async, like um, when I say, hey, hey, async, please make this payment. Um, the tr um, a trampoline payment, it's going to go to bit refill. Async doesn't know if I'm buying a gift gift card on BitRefill or if BitRefill is just another trampoline, and I'm gonna go make a payment to like Stacker News or to you, or you know, or if I'm actually just buying a gift card. So it kind of like gives you more plausible deniability there, of just being like, where is this payment kind of going? So, so how does the trampoline act different than a, a regular Lightning node would? If I'm routing through a bunch of different nodes, the, the nodes don't know where the payment's going either, right? Yeah, so when I make a normal routed payment, I say like, hey, async, here's my payment, give it to this next guy. And it's, it's gonna be someone that async has a channel with versus a trampoline is just like, hey, async, here's this payment, now make a payment to this guy. And it's not someone who they have a channel with. So it could be anyone across the network. So they have to do then like the actual routing algorithm of like figuring out how to get the payment to get there. But it lets you do this, um, you know, it kind of breaks that link of like having to calculate that entire route yourself. Um, I see. That makes sense. Okay. So yeah. Um, so that's like the, the major improvement. And uh, I think like blind and pass and trampoline routing on their own um, are powerful tools, but like together it makes it really powerful because you can still kind of get that uh, pain rel payment reliability back as well as, um, you know, improve the UX around it where it, it actually works and you get more plausible deniability and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So um, some of like these two are kind of close to happening, at least like in the Eclair Phoenix world. I don't know about the rest of the network, but um, I think I think actually LND is working on it. So I think it is hopefully coming soon. And I think um, as well, like a lot of the protocol devs understand, like this is probably like the most prescient thing they could do for lightning privacy. That's not like a complete overhaul of everything. So um, it's good to mm -hmm. see. But yeah. Now with this this report that you have released on uh, Lightning Privacy, what's is there a roadmap or a plan to extend some of these topics or to continue contributing to this this website? Uh, what's the plan moving forward for for this initiative? 
Yeah, I, I, I like since writing this, we've gotten some feedback and learned a lot. So I want to update um, some stuff, but it's all open source. So if people want to write, write issues or pull requests, they can um, definitely update it themselves. But yeah, we'll probably update it as things happen or, you know, like new research comes out and be like, oh, this is a problem. We'll write an article or something on it. So we wanted to make it like a a living kind of uh, research page. But, um, you know, it's only been out for like a month or two, so we haven't updated it much. But, uh, yeah, um, so, yeah, we'll probably be updating it. And, you know, if anyone listening to this has ideas or questions, they can um, make a pull request or an issue, and we'll be happy to answer them. Makes sense. Okay, now I thought we could get into Mutiny. This is a, a wallet that I, I saw a tweet that you posted a little while ago about Mutiny. It says, uh, with Mutiny, if you have a browser, you have a Lightning wallet. 2.65 billion people can have a lightning wallet if they go to our website. Can you give listeners a little bit of a backstory on how you decided to, to build mutiny, why the browser is so important? Yeah. I mean, basically um, me, me telling you Paul, when we were doing this lightning privacy research, we kind of were like, we should build our own wallet. And um, we, that was, that was like a year ago. And then um, Tony and Paul built a proof of concept in at a hackathon here in austin and then um they went to like kind of work on it more and one of them got banned from the app store on apple and they're like what the hell this sucks so um basically they just were like screw apple screw the app stores what if we did it on the most permissionless way to distribute things the web so basically um we're like let's do it so part of the bolt.fun hackathon um, we set out to like build basically a lightning node in the browser. And um, basically the, the way we do it is um, using BDK and LDK, um, really great libraries and really great teams. We got a lot of support from them working on this. But uh, basically like when you go to, I think if you go to testnet.muniwallet.com, um, it's our testnet version or reckless.muni.wallet.com is the main net version. If you go to those websites, there's now a lightning node running in your browser. Um, so it, like it all runs like inside of like Google Chrome or Firefox, whatever you're using. And like all the state is saved like into your browser storage and um, all that stuff. So there's like literally a whole lightning node running in the browser. Um, there's a lot of problems with that and um, hard things to do. The kind of the hardest was probably networking where um, like when you make a connection to another lightning node, it has to be like a raw TCP connection. Um, it's like, you know, raw, like basic internet connection, but from a browser, you can't actually make that. You can only do WebSocket connections. So we had to build a proxy around this where we, we basically just have this really dumb proxy that just takes in WebSocket connections and outputs TCP connections um, to whoever you say you want to open a connection to. And, um, and the nice thing is like, because Lightning is end-to-end -end encrypted and authenticated and all this stuff. Like, we don't have to worry about like encrypting any of the data or anything on top of that. It's all it all comes inherently with Lightning. But either way, yeah. So um, that was kind of our biggest struggle, but we were able to solve that. And then, and as well, like the hard part was just like no one ever done this before. So like getting support from BDK and LDK's teams, of, like they're like, wait, what are you doing? Like <laughs> you're a madman. And then, uh, you know, it, like a lot of our codes kind of just like. We took like code from LDK and just had to copy paste it and fix it for um, uh, to work in the browser. And you know we're, we're like you know making PRs now upstream to those two repos, but it mm -hmm. works. So yeah, we can have an entire lighting node in the browser, which is pretty awesome, I think, because like you know like we started this with like you know getting banned from the App Store. So it, like if you weren't around in like 2014, um, Apple bans like all Bitcoin wallets from the App Store, and you know people are like breaking their iPhones really mad and stuff like that. That's like, well, they, so like now if you had an iPhone, you couldn't have a mobile wallet. So with, with mutiny, you can just go to a website and now you instantly have a mobile wallet. Um, so it kind of like makes it extremely hard to like stop users from having mobile wallets. And as well as like, um, you know, the web is like an extremely like resilient platform. Like, you know, the government's been trying to shut down pirate Bay for like <laughs> over a decade now. And, you know, completely failing and um you know that's just a website so this is you know same thing like as long as anyone can host this like very simple website now you can serve lightning wallets so um you know and the nice thing is too it's very easy to 
self-host. So like um, you kind of have like when you go to like reckless.meanwhile.com, you have a little bit of inherent trust with us that we're not like changing the code and, you know, you're going to put money in and just immediately sweeps it to our address. But it's very easy to self-host where you can, it, you, like, it's just running a basic web server. So, um, you know, hopefully, you know, we're, we're working on, like, different guides and, you know, making it better so users could, like, just, like, host it themselves on, you know, maybe their own Vercel account or if they really want to, like, do it on their own bare metal, you know, post it on Umbral or something like that. And then, you know, then you just go to your own, like, you know, same way you talk to your Umbral, but on your phone. And then you can actually, like, you know, have a Lightning wallet that's, like, completely self-hosted in that regard. Yeah. What are the downstream implications of everyone having a Lightning wallet in their browser? Um, I think some of the integrations we could do will be really cool because, you know, the web is like the end all be all of like how basically most people interact with computers nowadays where, you know, your phone is, you know, like if you're using an app, well, most times it's just like a lot of times, you know, it's, just talking to the internet and, or you like click a link and immediately it just opens a browser and stuff like that. So if we can get, you know, basically any app will just immediately have a lightning wallet built into it where, um, you know, we think of like ways where you could have like a pay with mutiny button the same way we have like pay with PayPal or Apple pay. And you know, you know, you don't need to like check if these are has the app downloaded or anything like that. You just literally just go to like, you know, mutiny wallet.com slash pay and then like slash the invoice. And now, they're at the pay page and they just hit pay and it's instantly there. The same like experience you kind of have with all these other um, fiat payment networks. So I think that could be really powerful. And because it's the web, like, you know, we're kind of unstoppable here. So we can implement like, you know, a lot of the stuff we were just talking about was like privacy stuff. So, um, you know, but it's also like we talked about governments don't really like it when users do privacy seeking things. So, you know, maybe, um, you know, if we released a privacy lightning wallet on the app store, you know, maybe Coinbase wallet's okay, but our wallet's not okay and we'll get delisted. But being on the web, they can't delist us. So we can, you know, kind of build this censorship um, resistant, uh, you know, we're using the censorship, censorship resistant money. Well, you need to make a censorship resistant wallet as well. And, you know, kind of the web really enables that where it's extremely hard to shut down. So that's what I'm really excited mm -hmm. about it. Like, uh, it's been really interesting building it because when we did it, I thought people would be like, what the hell are you doing? You're a madman. Like this makes no sense. It, it kind of doesn't make sense. It's not the most secure way to do it. Um, but it's really cool in the censorship resistant aspects. And it, it's been cool to see a lot of people recognize that where they're like, yeah, this is like an unstoppable wallet that like, um, you know, no one can um, like kind of fuck with now. And it's, it's really cool to see. And I, it's, it's really been fun. Like people pointing that out and bouncing ideas off of that and stuff. Yeah. It, you're right though. The web, the web does seem to be having a bit of a resurgence lately. And I'm trying to wrap my head around why I, I think maybe there are some people who, who express these, the concerns about Apple and their dominance in app stores, things like that. But, you know, I look around the tech ecosystem and I see things like Replit where you're coding in a browser. I see Figma where you're designing in a browser. I see this mutiny now where you're you're running a lightning node in your browser. And I I see it happening all over the place. And I don't think everyone's doing it for the reason of privacy or the reason of, you know, getting back at Apple or or getting getting to be able to to be censorship resistant. Um, do you have any idea of why why we're starting to see so many web products come to I the fore today? I think it's a lot better of a developer experience as well. It's something I've talked about on Twitter a lot, but like, you know, we'll have, like, we had some user, like initially, like if you click the settings page, your seed would just be immediately there in plain text. So like someone was demoing it at a uh, bit devs and they hit settings and leaked their seed to everyone at the meetup. And like, you know, that sucks. So they made an issue and within an hour we had fixed it and deployed it and it was none, you know, and so now if someone had clicked settings page that wouldn't show up, you have to like click reveal. So you get, you get this extremely fast iteration process where like, you know, any update we do is immediately deployed and it can be fixed for users. So versus like the traditional app store kind of cycle is like one to two weeks where, you know, we like work on a new update. All right, it's ready. We need to QA it. And then like after it's ready, then we'll submit it to like Apple and Google. We wait for the, wait, wait probably wait for both of them to approve it. Once they both approve it, then we hit send and then, and then the users 
hopefully update the app. Versus like this is just like the second we deploy it, now any user going to the website will instantly have the updated version. So you kind of get this very quick iteration cycle and um, it makes, for one, makes like the, the user to um, team like feedback loop much better where anything we do is immediately getting feedback on and as well. Um, any improvement we make, the user instantly have. So like you're able to kind of outpace a lot of these things where, you know, some, you know, if we had it like in the app store, we could like, have you know, work on this feature or work on this thing. And then it, you know, comes out two weeks later and then, you know, user updates maybe a week later and then they give us feedback and it's like, okay, to fix that, we're going to have to take, you know, do that whole like three week thing again. And it's like, you know, it's just like a very long, arduous process. So we're, mm -hmm. you know, you're not delivering to the users as quick as possible. And because of that, you could be wasting time on things that users don't want or don't like, or are just like, you know, not the priorities they need right now versus like with, with the web, we can instantly deploy to them and allow us to really like just iterate so much faster. That's like something I've really enjoyed. It's just like, you know, we've gotten like, or like one of our friends gave us a design review and, you know, so like uh, if we're doing design stuff too, it's like a very, it's not just like hide the seed kind of thing. It's like, okay, like make sure this button's aligned correctly, do this and do that. And, um, but that, you know, we can instantly deploy it and then, you know, not just like the QA testers or whoever's helping, like, you know, make sure it's right. But like literally all your users will see the, the new updates so they can, you can get instant feedback or like maybe the designer's like, oh, this is a great idea. And then, you know, you deploy it and all the users are like, this is so ugly. What did you do? And then so you can revert it versus like with the app store model, you know, you would do that. And then in like a month you, you revert it. But like in that timeline, it's like, well, maybe the users are already now trained to this new design. So let's not revert it and, you know, you kind of get into this weird state. So this faster iteration process really, mm -hmm. I think helps, um, you know, as you know, Muni has like zero users or like two users. So it doesn't really help us as much, but I think for these other companies like Replit and stuff like that, like it really helps them a lot. Cause you know, as you're running a billion dollar company, you really need to be responding to like user needs and demands. And um, I think that really helps them. Yeah. Now, when I hear the words browser and wallet, when I first started Mutiny, the first thing that came to mind was, well, what's the closest thing to a browser wallet? Albi, and the, you know, being a browser extension. Can you can you highlight some of the differences between what Albi is doing as an extension and Mutiny as a browser wallet? Yeah. So, so my understanding is like Albi is more a like interface for your Lightning node where you'll connect Albi to like your L and D node running like on your server, like on Umbrella or something like that. So it's more of like a front end for your actual lightning node running somewhere else versus with Muni, it's an entire lightning node. Like, you know, it's L and D it's everything built inside the browser. So, um, you know, Alvi just kind of lets you make, make payments and receive payments for this is like actually running and like, you know, watching the blockchain you know, routing, sending an HTLC is like all that kind of stuff that the, the complex lightning stuff that it does. So we kind of have that difference there. Um, but the cool thing is like in the way we've built this, it's, um, you know, it's all like all the core logic is in Rust, which can kind of be ported anywhere. So like right now it's in the browser, but we could just take the exact same code and kind of port it into a, a browser extension. And then, so now we could like basically give, uh, we're actually like one of the Albi guys is one of our first users and we've been talking to them about like, you know, how could, could Albi run this and be like, instead of, if you don't have your own lighting node, okay, Albi will be your lighting node kind of thing. And now you have an entire lighting node running in a browser extension. So I think mm -hmm. that could be extremely powerful. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the difference there. Very cool. All right. I know we're running out of time. I want to finish this off with a round of what I do at the end of every show. It's called the lightning round few rapid fire questions for you. You ready? Let's, let's do it. I hope you're enjoying the show so far. Just a quick message from our sponsor, Stackwork. Stackwork is a lightning powered platform for generating high quality transcripts of all your audio or video content. They combine AI engines and hundreds of human workers all over the world who are paid over the lightning network to assemble these transcripts. And that's what lets Stackwork create better, faster, and less expensive transcripts. To see the results for yourself, you can check out my personal website where I host transcripts for all my podcast episodes. If you want to learn more about Stackwork, visit stackwork.com 
That is stakwork.com. All right, first one. If you could change one thing about the Lightning Network, what would it be? Oh, good question. Um, more users. Let's go with that. Let's be optimistic. <laughs> more users? Okay. Um, if you could make a guess on how much Bitcoin of public capacity will be on the Lightning Network in 10 years, what's that number? What are we at now? <laughs> About 5,000 now. 5,000? Okay. Um, in 10 years, I'll say 500,000. Wow. That's a big number. Um, are there any books that have meaningfully changed your view of the world? Um, the Three Body Problem series, probably it has nothing to do with Bitcoin or philosophy or anything. It's a sci-fi series, but that book fundamentally changed how I think about um a lot of like different, some I guess a little, some philosophical things, but a lot of like, um, like you know, are we alone in this world kind of things and stuff like that. So I think that's a great book series. Yeah. Who's one person that you'd like to give a shout out to in the Bitcoin or Lightning space for doing great work? Ooh, um, I'll give a shout out to Keon at Stacker News. I freaking love Stacker News and I, I really respect how he operates it where he's like you know i remember he gave a pitch at um the bitcoin magazine conference in miami and um you know he's talking about like oh like he doesn't take like any money right now like any rewards and stuff given plus into the platform is given straight back to the users and stuff and like he's really like just trying to like treat the user as best as he can so he can get the most users and really grow the product and i really respect how he runs that so shout out to keon yeah keon's great awesome well, thank you so much for the time. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. I learned a lot from it. And uh, where can listeners go to learn more about you and your work? Yeah, thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. Um, I'm Ben the Carman on pretty much everything. Um, yeah, if you want to have any questions or talk to me, probably just DM me on Twitter or something and I'll reply. But uh, yeah. Sounds good. Thanks again for the time. Hope thank we can you. do it again soon. Yeah, have a good one. All right, in the last 30 days, you guys sent in 88,075 sats. That came in from 95 different supporters. Massive shout out to everyone contributing sats. Let's run through some of the top five numbers we have. In the top five supporters of the week, first is Peanut Butter Life, sent in 44,443 sats. Anonymous user from Breeze sent in 6,886. Vake sent in 6,135. Pablo F7Z sent in 4,919. And Blockchain Boog sent in 2,865 sats. Big shout out again to everyone contributing. Now let's get into the recent comments. Uh, we had a number of comments that came in from episode 88 with Will Reeves. First one is from One Incredible. It says, great to hear about how the business evolved. Peanut Butter Life with the massive boost, 4, uh, 44,345 sats with a comment uh, and then a few extra sats as well. It says, over the year, I have gained a substantial amount of education from your show and wanted to say thank you. Looking forward to 2023. Happy holidays. Also, Fold is literally the best. I can't recommend this company enough. Massive thank you to Peanut Butter Life. Thank you for the kind words and for the massive boost. There's going to be a lot more coming in 2023. I'm working on a, a website upgrade that should make it easy for you guys to find clips and episodes on my site. Uh, and of course, going to have lots more interesting guests coming up next year. Blockchain Boog says, first time listener, really good podcast. I like the questions you asked, Will. Sent in 2,450 sats. Thank you, Blockchain Book. Bradley Chambers says, such a great episode. Again, in response to episode 88. Crypto Sanus says, HODL, in response to episode 88. Every Penny Evan says, great episode. Very excited to see the refinement of Bitcoin companies that stay afloat through cycles. And Pubra says, great point in response to episode 88 in that initial trailer, the first minute of the episode. 
thank you to everyone again for uh, for not only sending in stats this month, but all year long. It's been a ton of fun in 2022. Can't wait to do this even bigger in 2023. Looking forward to seeing you guys in the new year. Hope everyone had a happy holidays. Talk to you guys soon.